Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another class. So we are continuing our paragraph topic, how to write good paragraphs. And last week, we talked about um, the uses of the paragraph, the shape of the paragraph, and also the elements of a good paragraph, which are, you know, coherence, um, completeness, and unity, right? So today, we are going to continue on paragraphs, and we will talk about transitioning paragraphs and also um, the beginning and ending paragraphs, right? So we start with our word of the day, and it is bravado. So bravado refers to confident or brave talk or behavior that is intended to impress other people. In other words, it is a blustering, swaggering conduct. Her stories of her exploits during the olden days are always told with enough bravado to invite some suspicion that they're embellished a bit. So displays of bravado may be show-offish, daring, reckless, and inconsistent with good sense. Take, for example, the spectacular feats of stunned people. But when successful, they are still likely to be met with shows of bravo. Celebrities, political leaders, corporate giants, and schoolyard bullies um, have a different flavor of bravado. One that suggests an overbearing boldness that comes from arrogance of position and power. The word bravado comes from the old Italian adjective bravo, which means wild or courageous, which English has also to thank for the more ubiquitous brave. And so we move in to our class for today. So we start with transitions between paragraphs. An essay consists of ideas united around a central thesis and expressed in separate paragraphs. These separate paragraphs with their individual freight of ideas should be linked into a seamless train of thought. Among the several common techniques used to link paragraphs are repetition, transitional words and phrases, transitional questions, and bridging sentences. So let's go into repetition. Paragraphs may be linked by repeating in their initial sentences some word or phrase that is common and equally important to both. Look at the example below. So I have experienced loneliness many times in my life, but until recently, I lived loneliness without being aware of it. In the past, I tried to overcome my sense of isolation by plunging into work projects and entering into social activities. By keeping busy and committing myself to interesting and challenging work, I never had to face, in a direct or open way, the nature of my existence as an isolated and solitary individual. I first began to awaken, in the me awaken to the meaning of loneliness, to feel loneliness in the center of my consciousness, one terrible day when my wife and I were confronted with the necessity of making a decision. And this is from The Terror and Love in Loneliness by Clark E. Mustax. Or Mustakas, right? So the repetition of the word loneliness in the initial sentences serves to link the paragraphs. So the theme of loneliness is, um, it flows freely between the two paragraphs. There's no abrupt stop. There's no cutoff point. Um, he didn't just say one terrible day when my wife and I were confronted with necessity of making a decision. No, he first used his initial sentence and the repetition of the word loneliness to link both paragraphs. So now we move on to the more common transitional words and phrases. So depending on the flow of thought in the writing, you can choose from an assortment of words and phrases that link your paragraphs. These include, the fact is, should be the fact is. On the other hand, furthermore, moreover, 
in contrast, in sum, first, second, third, and so on. So we have an example here. In every cultivated language, there are two great classes of words which taken together comprise the whole vocabulary. First, there are those words of which we become acquainted in ordinary conversation, which we learn, that is to say, from the members of our own family and from our familiar associates, which we should know and use even if we could not read or write. They concern the common things of life and are the stock in trade of all who speak the language. Such words may be called popular since they be belong to the people at large and are not the exclusive position of a limited class. On the other hand, our language includes a multitude of words which are comparatively seldom used in ordinary conversation. Their meanings are known to every educated person, but there is little occasion to employ them at home or in the marketplace. And this is from Learned Words and Popular Words by J.B. Greeno and G.L. Catridge. Hope I said that right. So in this example, the transitional phrase, on the other hand, is used to link the first and second paragraphs. And by using these transitional words and phrases, your reader can tell what your purpose will be. So they're almost like keywords. So on the other hand, you know that this person is comparing and describing the two different classes of words, the popular and those that are um, known to every educated person, but are not usually used at home or in other informal settings. So right, using these words and phrases help your reader to know what your strategy and what your purpose is in your essay. And we can see that with some more examples here. So we have a strategy on one side and the keywords and phrases on the other side. So for comparison contrast, we have words and phrases like similarly, both on the other hand, which was uh, mentioned before. While, however, by no means, for sequencing, we have originally, before, after, initially, previously, once, cause and effect, as a result of, because, although, contributing factor, cause of, in effect, and for description, we have another, for example, such as, by no means, besides, additionally. And with that, we move on to transitional questions. So open an, opening a paragraph with a transitional question is one way to link it and its ideas to the preceding one. This usually adds an informal touch to the writing. So you know that you cannot use this technique in certain um, forms of writing and depending on what audience you're writing to, because in some cases, you are allowed to be a little bit more informal. In other cases, you have to be more formal. So rhetorical questions might not be the best tool for situations like writing a literal complaint or in certain problem solution essays, right? So again, we always keep our audience intact and what told we want to present to our readers. So the example we have here is, there are three kinds of book owners. The first has all the standard sets and bestsellers, unread, unnoticed. This deluded individual owns wood pulp and ink, not books. The second has a great many books, a few of them read through, most of them dipped into, but all of them clean and shiny as the day they were bought. This person would probably like to make books of his own, but is restrained by a false respect for their physical appearance. The third has a few books, or many, every one of them dog-eared and dilapidated, shaken and loosened by continual use, marked and scribbled in from front to back. This man owns books. Is it false respect, you may ask, to preserve intact and unblemished a beautifully printed book? an elegantly bound edition? Of course not. 
I had no more scribble all over first edition of Paradise, Paradise, Paradise Lost than I'd give my baby a set of crayons and an original membrane. That is from How to Mark a Book by Mortimer Adler. So here the sort of question, which serve as a transitional question, is the transition between these two paragraphs. And then we move on to bridging sentences. Some paragraph transitions consist of an initial bridging sentence that both sums up what went before and anticipated what is to come after. So bridging sentences are widely used in modern journalism and popular magazines such as Time. And they are also most times used in narrative writing. So from the execution of Mary Queen of Scots by James Anthony Prude, briefly, solemnly, and sternly, they delivered their awful message. They informed her that, that they had received a commission under the great seal to see her executed. And she was told that she must prepare to suffer on the following morning. She was dreadfully agitated. For a moment, she refused to believe them. Then, as the truth forced itself upon her, tossing her head in disdain and struggling to control herself, she called her physician and began to speak to him of the money that was owed to her in France. At last, it seems that she broke down altogether and they left her with fear either she would destroy herself in the night or that she would refuse to come to the scaffold and that it might be necessary to drag her there by violence. The end had come. She had long professed to expect it, but the clearest expectation is not certainty. She had played deep and the dice had gone against her. So here are the bridging sentences. She was dreadfully agitated and the end had come. It kind of sets up the reader to know the details that will be discussed in the paragraph, which is why it serves as a transitional technique. Right. But as a student, you will be most likely accustomed to just using transitional words and phrases. Is it bad to try these other techniques? No. But depending on the you know the context and the audience of your work, as I was saying before, transitional words and cue phrases might be the best technique that you can do for transitioning. But again, there is no defining bridge. You can ask your teacher or wall, I should say. Yeah, there's no defining wall between using the other techniques. Ask the teacher if they are, um, if they can be used, I should say. Right. Paragraphs without transitions. So paragraphs don't always need formal transitions between them. Sometimes the continuity of the theme is so strong between two paragraphs that it requires that they require no formal transition. Essentially, you must use your common sense. If a new paragraph introduces an entirely new idea or a significantly different wrinkle to an old one, you may need a transition. On the other hand, if the second paragraph merely continues to add details to what has already been said in the first paragraph, no transition may be necessary. Again, at your level, when you're expected to write at least four paragraphs with three, well, not four, five paragraphs, yeah. You're expected to write at least five paragraphs, one for the introduction, one for, I mean, three for the three main points, and one final one for the conclusion, you will nine times out of 10 need a transition between your paragraphs. So for longer pieces of work that actually go into detail with what is being discussed, they might not necessarily need transitions, right? So again, Use your common sense and keep your word count in mind, if there is one. 
So using various transitions. All writers eventually develop a sign develop signature traits in their style and might have a preference for a specific transition technique. However, overusing the same kind of paragraph transition means risking boring your reader. The ideal is to use a variety of paragraph transitions in your writing. So for this example, I will read. And this is from What Psychiatry Can and Cannot Do by Thomas S. Scissors, medical doctor. I'm very sorry, can't pronounce his name. And it reads, let us, for example, examine the case of a man I will call Victor Carlson. He is a junior executive with a promising future, a wife who loves him, and two healthy children. Nevertheless, he's anxious and unhappy. He's bored with his job, which he believes serves his initiative and destroys his integrity. He is also dissatisfied with his wife and convinced he never loved her. Feeling like a slave to his company, his wife and his children, Carlson realizes that he has lost control over the conduct of his life. Is this man sick? And if so, what can be done about it? At least half a dozen alternatives are open to him. He could throw himself into his present work or change jobs or have an affair or get a divorce. Or he could develop a psychosomatic symptom such as headaches and consult a doctor. Or, as still another alternative, he could seek out a psychotherapist. Which of these alternatives is the right one for him? The answer is not easy. For in fact, hard work, an affair, a divorce, a new job may all help him, and so may psychotherapy. But treatment cannot change his external social situation. Only he can do that. What psychoanalysis and some other therapies can offer him is a better knowledge of himself, which may enable him to make new choices in the conduct of his life. Is Carlson mentally sick? If we so label him, what then is he to be cured of? Unhappiness, indecision, the consequences of earlier unwise decisions. These are problems in living, not diseases. And by and large, it is such problems that are brought to the psychiatric's office. To ameliorate them, he offers not treatment or cure, but psychological counseling. To be of any avail, this process requires a consenting, cooperative client. There is, indeed, no way to help an individual who does not want to be a psychiatric patient. When treatment is imposed on a person, inevitably, he sees it as serving not his own best interests, but the interests of those who brought him to the psychiatrist and often pay him. Right. So from this um, extract, we see that using a variety of transitional devices can keep the reader engaged. So there were transitional phrases, questions, and bridging sentences. And all of the paragraphs cover the writer's theme quite well. So the details are there, unity is there, coherence is there, completeness is there, and we, the reader, are engaged in what is being written or what has been written. Right. So now we can move on to beginning and ending paragraphs, introduction and conclusion. So beginning paragraphs. Assess the following paragraph. In this essay, I should like to argue, argue that although more more tar boards are part of the traditional regalia worn at college graduations. These caps are uncomfortable and the convention of wearing them should be discarded. Though clear and to the point, this opening has no zest, no spirit, no magnetic draw. View the revised version below. In 15th century France, a motorboard was part of the common dress code Mortar board, I should say, was a part of the common dress code for university students. 
They were to distinguish themselves from the aristocracy, who wore velvet caps, and the clergy, whose caps were made of wool. But these distinctions being entirely meaningless today, it is senseless to burden students with the discomfort of having to march down an aisle and across a platform, mortarboard teetering to receive a diploma. Surely a gown is more is enough formal attire for the occasion. So in the reverse version, we have more intriguing and interesting information, especially on the origins of the mortar board. And then from these origins, the writer can give a platform for their stance on the subject. So they're saying, although the mortar board was, um, it had a clear purpose in 15th century France, which is, um, you know, being e easily distinguishable. There's no need for that today. And as such, the mortar board can be discarded, right? So the origins of a subject can provide interesting sidelights that might engage a reader's interest. So what are some strategies for beginning paragraphs? You can begin with an anecdote, a memorable personal experience, a question, a thought-provoking quotation, an ironic observation by answering the question posed by your title, with a surprising statement, by sketching a scene, or by beginning with a statistic. Now, there is no one-way lane to start your essay, but again, you have to use your common sense. For example, does your essay require um, intense statistical information or is your claim backed up by stati statistical um, facts? Most likely you can begin, begin sorry, with a statistic. If you're writing a description and you are developing a specific scene or you plan to refer back to that specific scene for your theme, you can sketch a, a scene or you can begin with a memorable personal experience. And yeah, basically overall, you have to think about what your essay is about, what the audience is and whatever, whatever. All of those things that we would have already spoke about in earlier classes. So with ending paragraphs, you should restate your thesis, summarize your major points, or emphasize your position. Do not bring up new topics or unrelated thoughts. Take leave of your audience with an emphatic exit. Do not timidly shrink or fade as this conclusion. And so, the reasons I have just cited are why animal experimentation is wrong. No writer can expect to inspire a reader with such a conclusion. Here's an improved version. Researchers defend their work on animals scientifically on the basis of similarities between animals and people, but then they defend the same work morally on the basis of their differences. Well, now they cannot have it both ways. Besides, the differences are not so clear-cut. Some animals have a more highly developed intelligence than some human beings. Ponder this question. If we were to be discovered by some more intelligent creatures in the universe, would they have the right to experiment on us? The revised version provides intriguing and interesting information. Wait, my apologies. The conclusion, I should say, it gives a more powerful feel and we as a reader are left with an impression. And of course, there's a question there that leaves a reader to ponder more on the subject of animal experimentation. So some strategies for ending paragraphs, end with a pointed question as was used before, end with an incisive summary. So summarize all your main points. Um, end with a perceptive ob observation, end with an allusion. The key to writing clever introductory and conclusive paragraphs is effort and rewriting. Most of the time, 
after the essay is written, the writer will discover from rereading and rewriting the material a way to make the opening and closing better. So here we have, what is the relationship between the beginning and the ending paragraph? Typically, essays hark back to their beginnings in their endings. The final paragraph may evoke the essay's opening or may only vaguely hint at it. This is usually done by alluding in the final paragraph to an image that occurred in the essay's opening. The tendency for essays to be circular in form, to end with a backward glance at their beginnings, can provide a gauge of whether or not you have strayed from the point. If your ending is widely different from your beginning, you should make sure the essay delivered just what the thesis promised and did not stray off into alien territory. So let us read the beginning and ending of a extract and see how they connect. So this is from Thinking as a Hobby by William Holding. While I was still a boy, I came to the conclusion that there were three grades of thinking. And since I was later to claim thinking as my hobby, I came to an even stranger conclusion, namely that I myself couldn't think at all. I must have been an unsatisfactory child for grown-ups to deal with. I remember how incomprehensible they seemed to me at first, but not, of course, how I appeared to them. It was the headmaster of my grammar school who first brought the subject of thinking before me, though neither in the way nor with the result he intended. He has some statuettes in his study. They stood on a high cupboard behind his desk. One was a lady wearing nothing but a bath towel. She seemed frozen in an eternal panic, lest the bath towel slip down any farther. And since she had no arms, she was in an unfortunate position to put the towel back up again. Next to her crouched the statuette of the leopard, ready to spring down at the top of the jar of a filing cabinet labeled A to AH. My innocence interpreted this as the victim's last despairing cry. Beyond the leopard was a naked muscular gentleman who sat looking down with his chin on his fist and elbow on his knee. He seemed utterly miserable. If I were to go back to the headmaster's study and find the dusty statues there, I would arrange them differently. I would dust Venus and put her aside, for I have come to love her and know her for the fair thing she is. But I would put the thinker sunk in his desperate thought where there were shadows before him. And at his back, I would put the leopard, crouched and ready to spring. So here, with this sample, we see that the beginning and ending paragraphs, they are indeed connected. So the opening paragraphs of this classic essay use statuettes to represent and classify into three distinct types, an image to which the ending also pointedly returns. This is a nearly perfect example of a final paragraph achieving closure by repeating an image which was used in the essay's opening. So as I said before, many essays, they have a circular structure where in the beginning, the ending will, um, where in the ending, right, the beginning will be looked back at, look, looked back at, right. And so again, this is one perfect example of how this can be achieved because the illustration set in the beginning is that which was revised or, or reviewed or went over again in the ending. And with this ending, we come to a definite com conclusion. So we open with a singular matter, a singular theme, and we close with that same theme, even though the writer um, himself would have come to a realization as he you know, has matured and become older and how he would have changed their positions. But the overall theme is still consistent and there is a circular path in the entire essay. Although we don't know what the supporting paragraphs look like, 
But from the conclusion alone, we can guess that it will be a well-developed, complete, coherent, and unified essay. And with that being said, thank you so much for joining. And I hope that you would have learned something today. I wish you all have a good weekend. And I will see you next time. Thank you again for listening.